itself. Now we can start. अरे सांगा ना मैं केला इतने इतने सांबा बोल रहा हूँ. Shahpur sir, you can start. Rest of the things have done. Yes, Priyanka. Yes, sir. You can start now. Yes, sir. Good afternoon to all the participants and our today's eminent speaker. Welcome to the second session of online faculty development program on engineering education and the industry, a post-COVID-19 perspective. I'm here to introduce our today's eminent speaker, Professor K. P. Karunakaran sir. Professor K. P. Karunakaran sir is our uh, is working as a professor in Department of Mechanical Engineering. in indian institute of technology bombay mumbai sir did his b honors from college of engineering anna university chennai in 1984 later he did his mtech from iit madras in 1988 and phd from iit kanpur in 1994 sir's research interest areas are rapid manufacturing cnc technology and automation laser technology computer graphics for cam application Sir has more than seventy publications in various international journals. Sir receives various prestigious awards like P K Patwardhan Technology Development Award at IIT Bombay in two thousand three. He got Humboldt Fellowship. He is a member of editorial board of various prestigious reported international journals in the field of mechanical engineering. He serves in various committees of A I C T of project selection, accreditation. And approval of PGA and PhD for various institutions. With these few words, I request Karuna Karan sir to start this session. Thank you. Oh, thanks a lot uh, to everyone. Good afternoon to all of you. I'll just do the sharing. Where is the sharing happening? Yes. Has sharing happened? No, sir. No, not sir. Yet, sir. I clicked it. It's not happening. Do it again, sir. Yeah. Now, now I guess it's okay. 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 Is the screen visible? Uh, no, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Now. No. no sir. What is visible? No sir. Screen sharing is not yet on. No, no sir. Okay, okay. Now it should be. No, now it's sharing. Okay. Ha, now sir. it now it is showing. Yes, yes. Okay. Now the screen is visible. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. Very good afternoon to all of you. So I will try to go till about one five zero. After that, uh, we will have some interactions. uh this is uh, new to me also because i am always used to have uh, interactive classes so first time i am confined in outside my room i don't see any faces except my computer screen but then you know this is something we will all get used to it as uh, the principal said it is actually a kind of blessing in this guys that we are all trying to get used to you know do business without really seeing each other so that's nice uh, is the screen okay everything is visible yes sir yes sir okay okay so the the topic for today is electron beam additive uh, manufacturing um uh, uh, this is how i have planned there are a lot of things that i need to cover which will go for a full uh, semester course we will just touch upon what is essential i'll quickly spend a few slides on introducing additive manufacturing and okay so after the brief introduction we will see different segments of electron beam additive manufacturing you know as you are all aware there are two important beams we use in manufacturing one is laser beam and the other is electron beam till now we were all using laser very popularly but off late electron beam is becoming popular so that's why i thought i will take this as the topic 
and uh, we are also new to this topic only for the last four years we are trying to understand and we are fortunate to have two very big projects in this area one for uh, developing a powder bed technology and the other for developing a cladding based uh, ebm technology interestingly both are funded 25% uh, by private and 75% by government so that indicates that this is a very very relevant uh, project with industrial uh, implications okay coming to okay okay coming to the introduction of uh, additive manufacturing all of you are aware that it's a layer by layer manufacturing process where uh, i think the figure is uh, visible you have the cad model the cad model is uh, divided into several slices so in other words you approximate this three dimensional object into several two dimensional laminate and then use one of the techniques to produce physically each of these laminate and then put one over the other so this is basically the principle of uh, 3d printing so because of this method of layer by layer manufacturing you see that what we get is really not we want but an approximation of that so wherever the surface is slant you get it approximated in the form of of a stair case so this is known as a stair step error okay so this is the first principle of 3d printing but then there is one more principle used in 3d printing as you can see here in this component there is a hole so when you put layers one over the other when you come to this region you need something to support so that is called support mechanism okay so we are we are already familiar with what is support mechanism for example when you want to construct this water tank after reaching some level you need to add scaffolds so similar thing has to be done in 3d printing automatically so every 3d printing method uses some kind of uh, support mechanism so you'll find that these are the two principles one is divide and conquer second is the requirement of a support mechanism okay so the first one leads to an error called stair step error the second one leads to an error which again affects the surface because this is the support this is the component when you try to remove the support from the component that interface will have some surface finish problem so there are two sources of uh, surface finish error in 3d printing one is because of the stair step uh, approximation other is because of the removal of the support but then this is tolerable uh, because we get the whole process automatic okay so that is about the principle of 3d printing now i want to make quickly two climbs for 3d printing the first climb is 3d printing takes us closer to the nature so i'll quickly go through some characteristics of uh, the nature first is in nature nothing rotates you look at the locomotion happening in all these uh, animals and birds nothing rolls only we roll because the the wheel was invented in uh, stone age after that we became obsessed with uh, symmetry as a result you find that manufacturing a circular geometry is uh, cheaper and easier than manufacturing a flat geometry rather than flapping the wings as a bird does we are not able to do it we fix the wing and rotate the propeller so these are all the problems of inventing wheel now another nature of uh, another characteristic of nature is nothing in nature is uh, flat or symmetric you see the kind of geometric complexity is nature is able to create but we always want to make something out of 2d and then convert it to 3d if you want to work on a package like solid works you try to define the cross section and then sweep it or extrude it or do something like that so we start with 2d and then we go to 3d we try to have as far as possible symmetric objects the third characteristic is in nature 
no object is homogeneous look at the tree or look at the bone but we want to have everything homogeneous if there is inhomogeneity we call it as an error the other characteristic of nature is in nature assembly happens together only in man made manufacturing we try to make individual components and then assemble as in this case whereas in nature the assembly is born in nature's manufacturing there are no wastages the way we have uh, uh, done in uh, man made manufacturing a lot of chips and swarf happens in man made manufacturing all these are because in nature the manufacturing is largely additive nature hardly uses a subtractive root of uh, manufacturing so that is the first uh, claim after the invention of 3d printing in 1987 which is the additive manufacturing route we have made a step closer to the nature that is the first claim the second claim i am trying to make is 3d printing is a disruptive process so initially 3d printing was used only for the total automation it gave you know you didn't have to write nc program it wrote the nc program by itself so we got what is called as total automation okay is it okay yavasthit sagala tikala tikala ka chhe ka chhe ka chhe so somebody's uh, mic is on okay now the, second, the the most important thing that people subsequently realized is some very interesting geometric and matrix capabilities as you see in this particular picture on the left side i have listed several geometric characteristics for example assemblies can be made directly as in these two cases then uh, you can make very complex ducts you have a hole here it goes like this take a circular path and then comes out you can make very complex geometry so these are uh, generally difficult by other manufacturing routes similarly on this side you see that the composition can vary from one end to the other now you see a job here which has honeycomb like structure so these are all becoming very easy to manufacture in um, today's uh, 3d printing these are known as functionally gradient objects where the object can vary inside in terms of porosity or in terms of the material composition so because of these unique geometric and matrix capabilities 3d printing is able to do what other technologies are unable to do or difficult to do. so these are two important claims uh, uh, in this uh, lecture the first one is 3d printing takes us closer to the nature the second one is it is a disruptive process so today we have reached a situation the technology is mature enough although it is only about 30 years old technology it is mature enough that if we can model anything in the cad system that can be 3d printed okay now i am coming to the introduction of uh, electron beam additive manufacturing so i have it as a separate ppt so i'll go to that okay so electron beam additive manufacturing uh, as is as i told you till now we were popularly using uh, laser as a competing uh, beam technology but uh, here i am going to list down some of the very interesting and significant advantages of uh, electron beam the first advantage i have listed here is um, higher energy efficiency 95% is the energy efficiency in uh, electron beam as against 15 to 25% in the case of uh, laser now this is a phenomenal uh, advantage because there are two problems in having low energy efficiency one problem is you consume more power that is okay but then the remaining energy what happens to that the remaining energy becomes heat then you have the responsibility of taking away the heat from that region so you need chillers in our case we have a 4 kilowatt laser the chiller alone consumes 5 kilowatt to take away the excess heat because 
when the laser is 4 kilowatt at the beam end, it consumes at least 5 times or 6 times uh, energy. So that has to be taken away. So that becomes a big problem that we see in automobile also. In any car, the energy efficiency is hardly 25 to 30%. So remaining 70% heat has to be taken away. So that is why you have big radiators uh, working there. So very often the cars get heated up. So extracting the wasted energy out of the working envelope is also an important problem. So high energy efficiency is a very important advantage of uh, electron beam. But more than the energy efficiency, I consider the second as uh, more important because that is listed as higher scanning speeds. See, you have a component, the component is sliced, so your beam has to address the complete uh, area of the slice. So the beam has to address in several scan lines. So beam is very sharp, hardly 0.3 millimeter in diameter. And your component may be 200 mm or 500 mm in size. So if you have to address the entire area, you have to scan the whole area very fast. In the case of laser, the maximum scanning speed is 10 meter per second. And people use hardly 2 meter per second in the case of uh, metallic 3D printing. Whereas in... Uh, Electron beam additive manufacturing, oh, you're going yeah. to have anywhere from 10,000 to Karun. 1 lakh meter per second. Is, is it okay? Okay. If, if there is silence, I assume that the presentation is going well. So now you see that uh, the, the speed at which an electron beam can scan is something like 1,000 to 10,000 times faster than laser. Now, when we say the speed is high, that does not mean that the productivity is high. Okay, you don't produce a component faster. But the benefit is in some other way. We are going to get components which are free from stresses. Unlike many other manufacturing processes, in 3D printing, you will find that the aspect ratio is very high. In other words, you are going to produce the component layer by layer. That means anytime you add a layer of something like 30 microns or 100 microns, okay, over a XY area of maybe 1,000 or 500 or 200. So if you take the largest dimension to the thinnest dimension, which is typically in Z direction, that is the aspect ratio. So if along X we have 200 mm and our layer thickness is 20 microns or 0 0.02, then your aspect ratio is something like 10,000, okay? So this kind of aspect ratio you will not face in any manufacturing process. Now, how do we create uh, this layer? You spread a layer of powder or something else and then scan it with the laser beam or energy beam. When you scan, you transfer energy. That means every point is addressed. When you address every point, you introduce heat there. So when you introduce heat in a sequential manner, you create an inhomogeneous temperature gradients. That leads to warpage, okay? But when you have such a high speed, a layer can be scanned in fraction of a second or few mic microseconds. If you can scan a whole layer in a few microseconds, it is equal to just giving a flash. That means the entire layer is virtually addressed simultaneously. That means there will be no temperature gradients. If there is no temperature gradients, then there will not be any residual stresses. Okay, that is what we consider as the most important advantage. It is not the productivity. So I want you to remember that high scanning speed in electron beam does not lead to high productivity, but it gives you a component which is free from residual stresses. That means the quality of the component will be very high. Warpages will be very low. There is another advantage of uh, 
you know, scanning a surface multiple times. So any layer, you scan thousands of times. Each time, the temperature increases by, let's say, 0.5 degrees centigrade or 0.2 degrees centigrade. So to reach a temperature of 1,400 or 1,500 degrees centigrade, you scan several times. When you scan several times, then the heat can soak downwards. If you scan the whole thing in one go, only the top thin layer will get heated. The heat will not have the opportunity to go down. But when you do this, the heat can go down. That means your layer thickness can be higher. If your layer thickness can be higher, the benefit is your particle size can be higher. When the particle size can be higher, the cost of the powder is lower. That is one. But in the case of electron beam, another very interesting thing happens. Imagine that you are dealing with laser as well as electron beam to write a layer of powder. When laser writes a layer of powder, the photon that comes at extremely high velocity comes to halt on the surface. So kinetic energy is converted into heat. So it melts or fuses the powder particles together and it vanishes because photon is an uncharged particle. On the other hand, when the same thing is done by electron beam, electron beam also, the electrons are coming out at something like 0.5 or 0.8 times the velocity of light. So when they hit the particle, they come to rest. So heat is created because of the kinetic energy conversion. But unfortunately, the electron being a charged particle, it also remains there. So the particle not only is melted, it is also charged. So when you have a loose powder and the powder becomes hot, and it's also charged, then <coughs> the consecutive subsequent, the, the particles, the neighbors, they ripple each other because each particle is loaded with several electrons and the electrons ripple each other. That leads to an explosion, okay? So when you use larger particles, the tendency for explosion is very less. So this is another reason why this high scanning speed is useful. Then as you all know, electron uh, beam works only in vacuum, okay? In the past, it was considered as the limitation or disadvantage of uh, ele electron beam additive manufacturing or electron beam welding system, but Today, it has become an advantage because when you produce something in vacuum, there is no contamination possible. Oxidation is simply not possible. Uh, of course, you are spending money in evacuating the chamber, but today we have pumps and uh, other systems. They are able to pump for their affordable. The third uh, interesting development is Every one of the 3D printing machines have a controlled environment. Even if you take FDM, the cheapest 3D printing method, fuse deposition modeling, the envelope has to be maintained at some 70 degrees or 80 degrees centigrade. Okay, that means just after closing, after loading the wire, you can start the machine. You have to wait for the machine to reach 70 degrees centigrade, then only it can start the operation. So this happens with every one of the 3D printing processes. While in uh, electron beam, you control pressure. In the case of other processes, you control temperature. Till the whole temperature stabilizes at some level, you don't start the machine. So no longer this kind of uh, delay is a limitation of uh, electron beam additive manufacturing. It is true with everything else. Therefore, vacuum is no longer a limitation, but it is an advantage because the component you get has very high level of uh, integrity. The second uh, point I'm putting in this slide is versatility. I'm mentioning two types of versatility. One is material-related versatility. The other is operation-related versatility. Electron beam, can handle all kinds of metals. Unfortunately, it cannot handle non-metals like ceramics and polymers. Otherwise, because electron beam means conductivity is required. So only metals can be handled, but it can handle all kinds of metals, whether they're thermally conductive or electrically conductive or not, 
they can handle. Whereas laser-based additive manufacturing methods will find it difficult to handle materials which are good in thermal and uh, electrical conductivity. For example, copper, aluminum, gold, silver, these are all extremely difficult for laser-based additive manufacturing, whereas uh, it can be handled nicely by electron beam. So we are actually foreseeing that in future, because of all the advantages that I've been listing, electron beam will be exclusively used for all metals and laser will be used for uh, ceramics and polymers. Now, the, the other type of versatility I'm mentioning is in terms of uh, operations. We saw that because of its extremely high scanning speeds, it's able to scan the whole surface again and again and again, thousands of times, every time increasing the temperature by about 0.2 or 0.3. So this we call as preheating. So the electron beam able to do preheating. After that, it can do the fusion. Then after that also, in case you think there is some uh, residual stress buildup possible, the same beam can do post heating. The fourth interesting thing uh, is, you know that all uh, SEM and all, you know, they make use of electron beam for uh, microstructural analysis. So whenever there is an electron beam, it is always accompanied by X radiation. So it has both positive and negative aspects. If it is exposed to a human being, then it is dangerous. So you have enough protection. But such an X-ray emission can be used for in situ microstructure measurement because you know the microstructure immediately. If it is not as per your expectation, you can even make corrections for it by making the necessary changes in the process. So this is something very new. Laser-based systems cannot do this. So that's why I'm saying electron beam is versatile in terms of operations also. Now, in terms of cost, today all electron beam systems are more expensive or at least equal to the laser-based additive manufacturing. For example, there is a uh, electron beam AM machine from uh, GRCAM. That is about 3.5 crore, whereas uh, the laser also costs almost the same. But we see that as, as, an, as the electron beam is becoming more and more popular, it, they will fall in price because uh, the number of components in any electron gun is much less than the laser-based uh, system. So the cost of uh, electron beam-based system can become lower than the laser-based system because laser means a lot of mirrors and optical systems, they require mechanical fine-tuning. In the case of electron beam systems, most of the fine-tunings are based on the electronic control because there are hardly any moving parts there. Okay, of course, uh, you know when we talk about so many advantages, you should also talk about the limitations of the uh, system. Uh, one important limitation, as you all will appreciate, is the need for vacuum. I already mentioned that vacuum was a limitation in the past, but not anymore because the pumps have become uh, powerful enough and cheap enough, and the vacuum helps in uh, getting a, a component without any oxidation. But vacuum has still some more problems. For example, you cannot have a casting inside. Your machine elements cannot be made out of castings because as you know, every casting has some dissolved gases entrapped inside. Okay, so when the vacuum is switched on, these gases start coming out of the casting. And then when the chamber is opened and exposed for two days, the castings once again absorb uh, uh, moisture, air, and then again disturb. So the vacuum doesn't build up uh, properly. So typically people prefer to go for uh, stainless steel based uh, building fabrication structures. Okay, so typically you have to go for uh, stainless steel fabricator structures rather than uh, castings uh, 
which are very common in uh, machine tools. Now, the second important thing is lubrication. Wherever there are motions involved, you need to lubricate. Uh, when you use grease or oil for lubrication, they start evaporating under vacuum. In fact, uh, sometime back, I went to uh, a, a jewelry company that fellow showed me, uh, you know, water boiling at uh, uh, atmospheric pressure. Because, I mean, I mean uh, atmospheric temperature, you know, the temperature was around uh, 40 degrees centigrade, but he applied vacuum and then kept water inside. Water started boiling. So he told me, sir, see so much of uh, air is dissolved in the water. That is why, uh, you know, the air is coming out. It's not really the air coming out, but the water operates because when the temperature decrease, when the when the pressure decreases, the, the the boiling point comes down for any material. So that's what happens. So the grease starts boiling. So when the grease starts boiling, not only use grease, but the vapor of grease goes and you know deposits everywhere, including the electron beam gun. So that leads to uh, malfunctioning. Now, when you have a, a transformer or even motor windings, the life of the lamination comes down because the vacuum tries to suck away the lamination. So the life of the motor comes down substantially. So people normally go for a special motors; they are available. Then as we discussed, you need high startup time and high uh, closing time. So you have to wait till the vacuum builds up. The vacuum is extremely high. The gun requires a vacuum of 10 power minus six tar. One, one tar is uh, uh, no, 10 power minus six millimeter of mercury. Let, let's look at that, okay? 10 power minus six millimeter of uh, mercury. To build that kind of vacuum, it takes some time, at least 20 minutes to 30 minutes it takes. Similarly, once the operation is over, you can't just open the door. You have to slowly leak air inside or organ inside so that the pressure inside and outside become almost equal. Then only you can open the door. So you can't start and stop instantly as you do on a milling machine. Okay, But then, as I said already, this has become uh, same in any additive manufacturing process because we do control the temperature before the process is started. The third, so we have, we have seen two, two problems. One is because of vacuum. The other is the starting and stopping time. Third important thing is absence of convective heat transfer. You know, we all know that three types of heat transfer take place, conduction, convection, radiation. Radiational heat transfer is not much because the temperatures are not very high. Okay, so in all these processes, we can ignore radiational method of heat transfer. Uh, so convective and conductive are the most important. But in this case, you find that because there's no fluid inside, you know, it's a vacuum chamber. There's no fluid inside, no air inside. Therefore, the conductive heat transfer is absent. Okay, that means you have to manage everything with I'm sorry, did I say conductive? The convective heat transfer is absent. So you have to manage the whole thing with conduction only, okay? So you have to look at different methods of uh, doing uh, certain uh, designs. So heat transfer becomes quite challenging, but it's not difficult. It's quite challenging because we are not used to it. We are all used to conduction, convection, radiation. Suddenly somebody comes and says convection is not possible. So you have to manage with conduction and radiation, which is not that prominent. So we have to work on that. Then as, as, as I told you, the radiational effects comes when uh, the voltage becomes beyond 60 kilowatt, uh, X radiation is possible. Electromagnetic interference is uh, possible. And that starts influencing the motor, relay, transformer, and you know, XY motion is achieved with deflection coil. So deflection coil becomes sensitive to that. So the design has to take into account all these interference and then accordingly design it. So, so I, I put here the bottom line, I don't know whether it's visible to you people, 
I put a line. These are not difficult, but new to us because we are all very new to working with vacuum, working with electron beam. So it's a question of getting used to it. Today, electron beam looks to be a wild horse, but then once we know how to tame it, then we'll be able to ride it, okay? So it's, it's not going to be difficult, but we will get used to it. So now uh, uh, there are three approaches for electron beam additive manufacturing. You'll find that 3D printing, any 3D printing or additive manufacturing is a layer by layer manufacturing process. But then how the layer is created, you know, there are many ways by which uh, you can do it, depending on the material form, depending on whether you are dealing with plastic, whether you deal with the metallic powder or whether you will deal with metallic wire, the methods are different. So in the case of uh, electron beam, uh, we see two popular types and the middle one also comes, the middle one doesn't exist. So one is a powder bed approach, second is a laminating approach, and the third is a cladding approach. So first and third exist as commercial processes, second doesn't exist today. I'll quickly go through these uh, three methods. So here you see the photograph of uh, this machine from a company called GE Arcam. Arcam is a Swedish company which developed this process about 25 years ago, not a new process, about 25 years ago. And then um, uh, about five, six years ago, General Electric took over, bought over the company, but they don't call it a GE, they still call it a GE Arcam. And a lot of development of RCAM is still taking place in uh, Sweden. Okay, the cross section shows uh, uh, the machine. What you see as a tower in the center, it is an electron uh, gun. Okay, so you have here a filament. Uh, the, the emission is known as thermionic emission. It's a, it's a tungsten filament. When current is passed through the tungsten filament, it becomes white hot. When it becomes white hot, a lot of electrons come out of it. And then uh, you have a cathode. Uh, I mean, this is the cathode. What emits the electron is a cathode. And you have an anode somewhere at the bottom. The voltage difference between anode and cathode is about anywhere from 30,000 to 120,000 volt. Okay, 30 kV to 120 kV. So it's a very high voltage uh, difference. You can actually visualize it more like our old TV. Today, we are all using LCD and LED TVs. I'm referring to the first version of TVs, which are known as uh, CRT, cathode ray tube. Okay, so the electron beam welding or electron beam AM, they are all nothing but our old type of uh, TVs with a different purpose and more power. Okay, so in, in old TV, uh, I have a picture to show it. Okay, I, I, the switching will be slow, so I'll not do it right now. Okay, so electrons are emitted and this is the vacuum chamber. This vacuum chamber is maintained at 10 power minus five to minus six uh, millimeter of uh, mercury vacuum. Okay, so, and then here you have two containers. These containers are filled with uh, metal powder. Now you have a table here, okay? This is the table stop surface. Initially, it would have been here, okay? And then it goes down every time by one layer thickness. And this is the filled area and layers happen like this, okay? So, th this, so this is known as powder bed technology. You from this container, you spread one layer of powder and wherever you need the area to be solidified, the electron beam rides on that area. Now, how is this uh, electron beam controlled? We talked about the scanning speeds of something like 10,000 meter per second. How is it achieved? That is achieved with the help of deflection coils. So here you see that there are a series of uh, uh, coils. The first one they called a stigmation coil. Second one is a focusing coil. 
and the third actually is only one is shown there should be two at orthogonal direction because one for x direction and the other for uh, y direction being a schematic diagram they have not uh, shown it so there should be two vertically one for x another for y so when the electron beam comes out of it this may be something like 10 millimeter size whereas the beam finally reaching the surface is at something like 0.3 or 0.6 millimeter so focusing has to take place so that is what is done by these uh, first two uh, coils and then you have a coil here by giving appropriate voltage to the deflection coil the coil are sometimes known as lens also but remember that this is not an optical lens it's basically a coil so you have focusing coil you have deflection coil two pairs of deflection coil one for x and y so by giving the appropriate voltage to the deflection coil you can position the beam anywhere at the required x y location so you see that there's no physical movement taking place in a cnc machine you have a screw rotating a nut and then the nut pulling that table so a lot of inertia is involved in it now when you talk about laser laser has a tiny mirror still there is a mass involved but the mirror is so small compared to the lead screw and table so you can have an acceleration of something like 5000 to 7000 g when i say g 1 g is one gravitational pull that is 10 meter per second square so a laser can move with an acceleration of something like uh, uh, 50000 meter per second square to 70000 meter per second square and its velocity can go up to 10 meter per second and metal guys use maximum of 2 meter per second because they do only one scan and by that scan uh, enough energy has to be absorbed by the powder so they don't do multiple scans whereas an electron beam we do multiple scans so we go up to 10000 meter per second easily so here we have a short video showing uh, it's working i'll move a little faster what is not relevant so this is that turbine blade they are going to make so you see that they are slicing it after that the slice data is sent to the machine through the interface so you see the two drums which contain the powder so before starting the machine you fill both the uh, containers with powder and at the bottom you know it will leak so it will uh, go from one end to the other come back So you see, this is the powder. So there is a blade which spreads it. So you will see that flashes are happening. This is how the particles uh, melt by absorbing the heat. So you will see flashes happening. See, so it's not looking sequential. It is actually sequential, but it happens so fast at ten thousand meter per second that it looks as if it is a flash. That is why you get. very uniform temperature distribution and hence no residual stresses happening there so this is how in an additive way layer by layer manner the component is built in the powder bed technology then you take out the component then you blow it you know you have a complete cake okay but the surrounding material can be just blown out by compressed uh, air so you have the component ready so this is how it works but as i said you know when when the electron beam uh, comes and hit the particle the electrons remain there so the particles tend to repel each other and they explode okay so to avoid that people spend lot of uh, support material so in in laser based additive manufacturing virtually you know 98% of the material Uh, will be converted into either component or remaining powder can be recycled whereas in uh, electron beam based powder bed technology lot of support material is used uh, to avoid this uh, smoking problem okay so we we propose then why not make use of sheet based uh, manufacturing so instead of use this, spreading a layer of powder we wanted to spread a sheet of uh, a metallic uh, layer and then write on it in which case uh, there will not be any explosion possible but we have no funding for it so this is still at conceptual uh, level 
globally such a machine doesn't uh, exist because you know you'll be wasting a lot of material also if you're dealing with material like titania it's very expensive so we should go for nesting and all other uh, complications so nobody has developed uh, such a machine but we are ambitious to develop it in future okay so right now we have seen two methods one is powder bed technology where you spread powder right on it with uh, Oh, 146 already. Write on it with uh, 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 laser or uh, electron beam. Uh, the other method is you do welding only. It is more like a welding process. I'll show the video of it. <clears throat> this is a company known as Siaki. Siaki is actually an Indian uh, you see this is a welding process basically electron beam based welding process so in in uh, lines it creates a layer So beam is off for the purpose of illustration. That's invited. So here I have a table which compares powder bed technology that was discussed first and the deposition technology or cladding technology that was discussed just now. So you have seen both the videos. So you can visualize that in powder bed technology, the most important advantage is you don't need a support mechanism because the remaining powder acts as a support. In the case of uh, cladding or deposition technology, you need a support uh, mechanism. Uh, we try to achieve that with the help of a five axis motion. As you can see in this machine, you have a rotary table. So there is a C axis and there's an A axis. So by tilting these two axes, you tilt in such a way that uh, the gravity doesn't come into picture. So it is appropriately tilted so that the droplets are captured. So you try to avoid the support mechanism by that method. and being a welding based process, you also saw that the layer thickness is very high, so it necessarily requires a finish uh, milling process. But you also notice that during the announcement, he says the deposition rate is extremely high. In powder bed technology, the deposition rate is hardly 0.1 to 0.5 gram per minute, whereas you can go easily up to half kg per minute in the case of cladding technology. So each one has its own application. If your component size is limited to 400 millimeter per minute and you don't want to do any finish milling, then go for powder bed technology. If the component is going to be two meters, one meter, and uh, you can do the post milling process, then go for deposition technology. Each has its own advantages. So uh, I'm very close to winding up. So we have two important processes. One is powder bed technology and the other is wire-based cladding technology. Both are uh, something like five crore uh, each. Uh, out of that, for the powder bed technology, we have collaboration with uh, AS Manufacturing Systems in Bangalore. For uh, wire-based cladding, we have collaboration with the LNT Mumbai uh, in Pawai. So, these private partners give 25% uh, of the money in cash. Once they give the money to us, government of India gives the 75%. So both these projects are on and uh, running right now. 
So what I'll do, uh, these, both these projects have started. So I'll quickly show our design. I'll not go into the details of it because we don't have time. So this is the machine design right now. This is our uh, powder uh, bed technology. This is the chamber uh, we have built. The chamber will have a sliding door. So this is in closed condition, this is in open condition. Initially we designed a, designed a sliding uh, system, but then later we realized that people said that is more expensive and uh, cumbersome. So we, we subsequently went for uh, the hinged door type. And this is the design uh, we have uh, made. Uh, we have uh, we are going to get it fabricated by private parties and then assemble them at our end. So these are the various views. And this is the tray in which we will fill uh, metal powder and then this tray when it moves from one end to the other, it will do the spreading. And somewhere here, this is the working area on which uh, the table will be positioned. And we also have a milling process. Ours is a combination of addition and subtraction. We are hybrid people. We combine additive manufacturing and subtractive manufacturing. So we are hybrid. Uh, all our systems are hybrid in nature. So, so this is how it will happen. Uh, this is the mill, milling cutter, which will go and it will take care of pulling. So there are, you will find that XY motions of the beam is controlled by the reflection coil and XY motions of the cutter is controlled by the physical movement of the uh, lead screw based uh, system. So this is how it is. So this is where our table will be moving down vertical. So we are going to use either scissor lift or this type of uh, lead screw based table. So we have given the final decision to our uh, partner because our partner is a machine tool company. So they are not very happy with scissor lift, although I want that to be used. Ultimately, the partner's uh, decision is important. So the second process is for LNT. It's a wire-based uh, technology. So the machine looks uh, something like this. It's a five axis system because we have only wire, no support mechanism. So here we have decided to use a sliding door because the size is becoming very big. The working envelope itself is uh, uh, 600. So the whole chamber comes to almost uh, uh, 1.7 or 1.8 meter. So hinged door becomes very unstable and uh, unwieldy for it. So we have gone for a sliding door with a lot of uh, viewing windows on it. You see a lot of, uh, at the top, you see two guns. It will make use of two electron guns. Okay, the powder bed technology will use a single electron gun. Here we'll use a two electron gun. Uh, each gun will write a semicircular, uh, each will address half of the wire to melt it. Uh, unfortunately, there's not enough time to describe why we need uh, two guns. And what you see here, these are the, vacuum pumps, you know, you need, uh, the vacuum pumps will be very big in size because within about 20 minutes, you have to evacuate completely and reach extremely high vacuum. The vacuum will be created by multiple levels. Initially, you will have uh, uh, a regular rotating pump that will take it up to something like 10 power minus two uh, millimeter of height, uh, HG. Then either a diffusion pump or a turbo molecular pump will take over that will do the remaining uh, thing. Even cryogenic pumps are available when you want uh, 10 power minus 10 or 10 power minus 12 vacuum. That kind of vacuum is required in uh, the electron beam based measurement system like microstructure using SCM and all, you need that kind of vacuum in those systems. So the, we are going to have a milling system. This is our ATC. It's a horizontal cutting system. So there will be four or eight cutters mounted on it and it will index and the required cutter will come to position. So this is our z-axis with the two rotary axis. So you see that this entire thing will move in x direction, this is y direction, and then a and c will be here, and the scissor itself will take care of the z movement. It's a five-axis based uh, system uh, here. Now I'll come to the 
conclusion so <clears throat> we have seen that uh, uh, 3d printing has uh, two principles one is a slicing and the other is support mechanism and we also saw that each gives rise to two different uh, errors of surface uh, finish and i also made two claims uh, for additive manufacturing the first claim was 3d printing takes us closer to the nature second claim is it's a very disruptive process because of its uh, interesting geometric and matrix uh, capabilities coming to additive manufacturing of electron beam we use two types of beams i call them as hed beams high energy density beams laser and electron beam these are the two things and i quickly made a comparison we found that energy efficiency is much higher in electron beam and it has extremely high scanning speed i also told that scanning speed is not going to help in productivity but it will help in getting residual free uh, the a component which is free from any residual stress or warpages we also saw that electron beam is extremely versatile and in future it can become cheaper also because of all these reasons we feel that all metallic manufacturing will be by electron beam even for welding electron beam welding also will become affordable of course arc based welding is going to be cheaper than electron beam because the energy efficiency of arc is also uh, about 90% so laser will be limited to only ceramics and polymers in our lab we are developing two electron beam based additive manufacturing process processes one for powder based uh, technology and the other for wire based technology the first is both are industrially funded 25% money comes from industries and 75 from the government and uh, that that illustrates the industrial relevance these companies will take the ip sharing and they will commercialize the process our ambition is to bring down the price as compared to the imported uh, equipment's price indigenous price should be a tenth of it what they manufacture we should be able to sell at a tenth of their price by indigenization and innovation just by indigenization you can bring down the price of any imported good by a third because you know a lot of transport is involved insurance is involved their own greedy profits are involved so you eliminate all of them so you can introduce a factor of 3 just by indigenization and if you add your own innovations indians are extremely good they are innovative so by adding our own innovations we will be able to bypass any of the ip related issues and we can bring down the price uh, subsequently we have already demonstrated it on a sand 3d printer we have developed a sand 3d printer using a similar uh, model using laser based system there we have proved that we are able to bring down the price by a tenth through these two approaches of indigenization and uh, innovation uh, we have also done some interesting work on uh, path planning for want of time uh, we could not uh, do that so with this Uh, i tried my best to put the whole thing in a nutshell i hope it made some it gives you some idea of uh, what is uh, additive manufacturing using electron beam and what are the kinds of uh, work we are doing in iit bombay so with this i will stop uh, if there are some questions we can have uh, discussions thank you very much thanks to rgit for the wonderful uh, opportunity to interact with all of you during this uh, tough time i stop here open for uh, discussion hello yes sir we can hear you i, I hope things uh, went well uh, absolutely perfectly uh, sir it was at least communication nice was uh, not interrupted very nice no no it was perfectly seamless uh, uh, transition of your of your slides and everything was so well yeah yes over nice. to the anchor of today thank you very much sir for this wonderful session uh, it is a very high effortful session about laser beam technology in 3d printing
And as you say, we can go with many types of 3D uh, material for 3D manufacturing. From the audience, we got say, so many questions. Out of these few of them, I would like to ask, sir. Can I ask, sir? Should I, should I stop the sharing or what should I do? Yes, I think uh, you, uh, now we should stop the slide sharing because it may uh, again create little problem in uh, both the yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. So, so how do I stop? Or you can override it? Administrator can override it? It's okay, sir. It's already stopped, sir. Stop. Oh, okay, band ho gaya. Hai. Okay. Very nice. Chapur, okay. sir, please check the audio audio uh, at your end. It is properly plugged oh, yeah. because we are uh, not getting clear audio from your side. Yeah, I'm not clear. Yeah, I'm not yeah, ask the question now. Ah, yes. Sir. As far as possible, we'll avoid the slides. Uh, I'll try to answer orally. Audio, sir. Hello? Yeah, who is asking, Mr. Nilesh? Huh? Yeah, yeah, sir. Yeah, go ahead. So, from the audience, we got so many questions, sir. Out of this, I would like to ask some few questions, sir. Is it? Shall I, shall I ask, sir? Yeah, go ahead. Sir, can this technology be used for all eyes? Is it, uh, is it able to control intergranular corrosion in alloy articles? Mm, can I repeat again, last part? Intergranular? Uh, intergranular corrosion in alloy articles. See, uh, I don't know what he means by uh, intergranular and all that. Any metal, see, as long as it is a metal, as long as it can conduct uh, electricity, it will be able to handle. It is an alloy metal. Yeah, yeah, any metal. Any metal. Any metal can be handled as long as it's available in wire or powder form. Yes, sir. Sir, Only sir. few materials like cadmium, uh, zinc, these are all low vapor pressure materials. They are very few. You know, they also have very low melting. So what they do, they evaporate quickly and then go and deposit on the electron gun. Except these three materials, everything else can be handled. Cadmium, zinc, and then um, I think lead. Other than that, everything else can be handled. Uh, one more question. Uh, power consumption is high in this type of operators. So, is there any way to minimize this power consumption? Power consumption is very low in electron beam. Laser has high power consumption. The energy efficiency, that is, we call it the wall plug efficiency. Whatever you take from the wall plug and what it reaches the beam as thermal energy, that is very less. In the case of laser, in the case of laser, it is hardly 20%. Whereas in electron beam, it is 95%. So energy efficiency is high in two senses. One is uh, the conversion itself is very high. Second is you work in vacuum. So you don't lose energy by way of convective losses. Otherwise in uh, laser-based systems, a lot of heat is lost to the atmosphere by convection. So in both ways you gain in electron beam. So electron beam is energy efficient. Yes. One of the question I got, sir, uh... If possible, please, can you explain what is the, uh, how OLED technology works? How LED technology works? <laughs> OLED. <laughs> See, the, 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 each, each pixel is an LED, right? Yes, sir, yes. Sir. Each pixel is an LED and then uh, uh, during the scanning, uh, it is activated, so emitting is uh, happening. So I don't know how I can explain it more than that. But today we have LEDs, you know, who are multicolor. Yes. So you have multiple, multi, so RGB mixture takes place, red, green, and blue. So you have at every pixel now three LEDs. Okay, by appropriately activating it with different intensities, you can get different colors. So in, in computer graphics, you know, we study about it, you know, we, we have something called uh, bit planes, you know, the entire memory, video RAM, video RAM is divided into 
organized into bit planes and then you know uh, uh, frame buffer I, I i can go on and on but uh, i don't know whether that is the intention yes. otherwise each each pixel consists of a red green and uh, uh, blue led by uh, differentially controlling the intensity of them you get different colors if if all three are off you get black color all three are equally lit you get white color with different proportions you get different colors i don't know whether i answered satisfactorily yes yes sir but i i can i can request uh, i can give a good reference uh, there is a book uh, of the title uh, mathematical elements of uh, computer graphics by rogers and adams it's an excellent book costing around 600 rupees indian edition is available uh, the first chapter describes this concept very nicely how picture tube works how led works these are described nicely um can i continue for one more question yeah you feel free i have enough time <laughs> how can we compare laser beam 3d printing technique with the other 3d printing techniques in terms of fast accuracy pre processing and post processing requirements uh, you want to compare with uh, fdm and things like that yes Use the, i mean non laser and laser yes yes okay so laser based process is definitely more accurate and more expensive see among the 3d printing process the cheapest process is uh, uh, fused deposition modeling for uh, plastics but laser uh, if you are talking about powder bed technology and uh, laser that is ultimate that is the most popular till today because it is accurate but it is expensive laser was the first uh, tool used in 3d printing no it it, it worked on uh, liquid based process so laser is a very versatile tool before electron beam uh, came now when i in this lecture i am talking like a salesman for electron beam i am trying to promote it but till now laser has been ruling the scene in terms of versatility uh thank you very much sir uh i would like to ask uh, professor sadala to give a word thanks sir adi video oh, th video thanks dr bokade for this opportunity it's an interesting session you know i'm i'm getting used to talk without seeing people thank you sir thank you so much it was really hello interesting wonderful and knowledge gaining session yeah sadala sir please hello yeah yeah go ahead sadala sir go ahead yeah thank you professor shahpure sir good afternoon you all it's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion on behalf of mct's rajiv gandhi institute of technology i would like to thank today's most respected eminent speaker professor k p karuna karan for giving online valuable talk on electron beam technologies in 3d printing the advantages of electron beam technologies as compared to the laser beam technologies in 3d printing for different real time applications are covered in detail in this session sir your talk was very much informative thank you very much sir i would also like to thank all participants for their online presence with such a large number thank you thank you all for spending your valuable time over to professor shahpure sir thanks a lot thank you sir thank you sir uh, with this we are ending our uh, today's session i would like to tell our tomorrow's morning session is uh, professor eminent speaker is ss mantha sir former aict chairman new delhi he is going to deliver a topic creating a content to develop future vision and vision post pandemic i would like to request
all please join session at 10 am sharp thank you thank you all thank you thank you bye bye thank you sir thank you thank you bye bye take care thank you sir thank you